one of the strange anomalies that you have is if you go out for a meal, I will pick up a glass and look at it for fingerprints. Or I will pick up cutlery and I will go, oh, that's a nice fingerprint. And my wife will go, what the hell are you on about? I can't even see it. And I go, well, it's there. Look, if you get the light right, there it is. You do tend to look at things maybe in a slightly abstract way. We tend to specialise in proactive photography. That is around using photography as an enhancement at the crime scene or here within the laboratory. So it might be to enhance up blood on clothing, it might be to enhance up injuries using UV, it might be to record latent marks at a scene that you wouldn't find unless you use a laser or something similar. And nearly all evidence types have to be recorded in a photographic medium if you're going to present them at court. We have a, an ops room here that takes in calls from generally crime scene managers or officers who are dealing with particular investigations and they will ring us in the jobs that they might have for that day. So it could be a murder, it could be sexual offences or it could be from our firearms people who want some high speed video done. We never know what's going to happen for that day and that's one of the nice things about the job is that it's not regular. There's a huge variety of work. When you go to a crime scene, you're composing that image in your mind when you're stepping in that door and you're looking at what you've got to assess and what you've got to see. And you're trying to get that scene into a compact form so that you can get across to the jury what is there, but in the minimum number of photographs. For us, it's a thought process as much as a physical hands-on process. In actual fact, the camera in most types of photography that we undertake is irrelevant. It's about light. It's about understanding where the light's going and what we need to see within that image. Types of evidence are often particular to particular wavelengths. If we're going into a sexual assault scene, we know that one of the peak wavelengths for body fluid is about 440 to 460. Well, we happen to have a laser which is attuned at 445. If they then say, well, actually, Nick, we need to look for maybe other people who might be in here at the time, then we can start looking with things like ultraviolet, which bring up different sets of marks to the 445. Then we start looking with the green laser, which brings us different marks to what we'd see with the UV. So you're building up this sequential pattern of search, which basically yields somewhere between 40 and 60% extra marks than you would do if you just went in and powdered. Every scene is completely different. You've got to keep a very open mind. A few years ago now, a gentleman in North London was murdering, and on being asked to look at the flat for blood, we stumbled across what looked like maybe a name or something written on the wall. But the ultraviolet wasn't really doing the job. But thinking outside the box, we looked at using IR. In this case, we used an IR video camera. And when we used that to illuminate the wall instead, we actually found that we've got the names of possible victims written up on the wall that he'd actually painted over the top of. So it's about you know, being very aware of what's going on in that scene, and is there more to that than meets the eye? Technology has had a massive impact. In reality, it's decimated the numbers of photographers employed by police forces. Everybody's got a phone, an iPad, a compact camera, even a small digital SLR. It doesn't make you a photographer. It just makes you somebody who owns a camera. You know, there's a big difference between the way that I would perceive a scene, I think, and the way that somebody else might. The problem is, if you've got limited training, say, for example, a fatal accident, and you're trying to recreate that for the jury as is, with true perspective, one of the most common things that I see is the use of things like wide-angle lens, which clearly distorts perspective and appears to make the vehicles look twice the distance they are away. So if you put that into court, you're actually giving them false information. You're actually giving them a false impression of that scene because, you know, you've got rid of all your experts. The level of knowledge is reduced. One of the big differences here is when we're doing property, often it's shot in the horizontal, not in the vertical. Because if you shoot in the vertical, you're limited to the camera to worktop height. But if you shoot in the horizontal, I can put that light anywhere I like. And in some cases, you might have that ball light six foot away to get that mark to come up properly. And that's the critical bit. You know, we're talking of minutiae here. We're talking of areas 0.3 of a mil across. There's no other point in time that you're going to get a second go at that. And if you don't capture it there, there's no chance further down the line. So in reality, if we didn't do these techniques, we are missing huge chunks of evidence. When I was at college, I didn't go for a job at a hospital because I don't like the sight of blood. But when you're in a scene, you're actually in there to do a task. 
that's what your mindset is, that's what your thought process is around, how best to record that. So it doesn't have that shock factor, perhaps, that some people might think it has. I think when you have input into a case and there is an outcome, there is a sense of satisfaction in knowing that the effort you've put in has got a reward at the other end.